Well, good morning. Uh, great to see everyone uh, today. Uh, listen, it's great to be back. Um, some of y'all were here last week, know that uh, Tara and I were out of town. We were actually up uh, taking care of grandkids uh, for eight days while mom and dad were on a mission trip, and it's really good to be home, uh, by the way. Uh, but there's something about being in, like, home church as well that uh, is just really, really good. So uh, I want to take a little bit of my real estate today to talk about um, a little bit about what's going on in our world. Uh, reality is things are crazy right now, and we're in this series that uh, is on the book of First John, and we're going to talk about the idea that um, the idea of prove it, and the idea of prove it is uh, oftentimes if you love God, if you say you love Jesus, if you say you, you love your brother, John kind of lays out the case that there needs to be something in your life that is verifying that you do in fact love God, and you do in fact love your brother, and you do in fact love Jesus. And one of the things that I think is so vitally important is that we understand that as we love one another, there needs to be a, something that kind of lays out that we truly do love one another. And we have a situation going on in our world that I think is, is an opportunity for us to be concerned with Big C Church as much as Little C Church. Little C Church be the, the local church, but talking about the global church right now, um, they expect at this point in time there have been Three million refugees that have left Ukraine over the last couple of weeks. Um, essentially, three million people who are homeless. Um, and the church is stepping up, and we actually have a mission that we support. Uh, it's the Biblical Institute in Zagreb, uh, Croatia. Uh, that's kind of close to my heart. Uh, one of the reasons why is one of my best friends in the world uh, is, is president of of the Biblical Institute there. His name is Perry Stepp, and he's the son of Errol, who's our founding pastor. Uh, and my daughter worked uh, at, at, at the Biblical Institute a few years ago, and had it not been for, uh, for COVID, would have worked a little bit longer uh, and different things like that. But uh, the, the, the institute there in Zagreb, which is the capital of Croatia, uh, is mobilizing itself to take in refugees. Uh, they expect uh, very quickly, if not already, 20,000 will flood into just the city of Zagreb. And what they are doing is they are renting apartments. And they're renting two-bedroom apartments, and they're putting mom and kids in one bedroom and mom and kids in another bedroom. So basically, in a two-bedroom apartment, uh, they're going to be housing two families uh, as far as refugees are concerned. Uh, the cost of that uh, to the Institute is, uh, including food, $1,300 a month. And we talked this week and felt like perhaps God is calling us as a church uh, to take the effort and, and support some refugees. And how many refugees we do, I, I, we are, we're not sure how many families, we're not sure but we have set up on our online giving, uh, on our app and, and on vv.church, uh, an opportunity for you to give uh, to help th with the, the refugee relief uh, there in, in Europe right now. And as we do this, one of the things I want to say is, you know, anything will help. However, once the news cameras go away, there will still be refugees. And so what we're asking for people to do is to make a two-year commitment. So it's probably not something to do just right now. Put some thought and prayer into it and see what God is calling you to do uh, to help with this. So I'm going to pray, uh, and then we're going to dive in uh, to our message. Father, I um, pray for your church. I pray for um, those who have been displaced those who have been forgotten. And Father, may we as the body of Christ truly reach out to members of our body that we don't know and probably will never know this side of heaven. So Father, I pray for your church to be the church, to be a place of refuge and strength in our world. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we talk about evil, 
in the world. The world is an evil, evil place. And we could talk about global stuff, right? We could talk about the global stuff, that there's, there's, there's evil that is going on, and it, it makes the news. But there's also the micro stuff. It's the small stuff that we rarely hear about. We were up in Dodd City this last week, um, and we were taking care of our grandkids, and uh, we kind of realized how many times can you take them to the park. Uh, so we took them to the park, and uh, Dodd City has this cheesy free zoo uh, at Wright Park that's got about, I think, 13 animals all together. Um, but anyway, we took our grandkids, and I, we took our, uh, our grandson, and he was there, and it, they were in this big play place, and he, he made a friend. Uh, he made a friend, and we walked around the zoo with him and his dad and different things, and his dad was a minister in Dodd City, and my son's a minister in Dodd City, so we made connection that way. But it was interesting that he was telling about his son that was adopted that pretty much for the first three years of his life was never held. He was never held because he just stayed in a playpen. He never cried. There's still ramifications of that going on in his life. And so we talk about big, we, we talk about big evil, but then there's little evil that's happening all around. Where does that come from? Why does that happen? John, as he is, is explaining kind of what's going on in the world, he starts in chapter 2, verse 15, and he says this, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, and the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And you, some of your, your Bibles may say the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And then it goes on to say in verse 17, and the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So if, if you'll do this, there's a couple of things I want to just kind of bring to your attention. If you're a person who marks in your Bibles, I would encourage you to mark the word abide here. It's going to be important in the book of 1 John. It's important for our message today, and we're going to come back to that. But I want you to notice again in verse 16, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's not for the Father, but it's from the world. Here's, uh, here's kind of a blanket statement that I want to say. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is the dominant path of this world. People, as they walk along, as we plod along, what, what, what drives this, the, this world is sin. And if, if you want to look at this collectively, whether it be of the flesh or of the eyes or the pride of life, or you want to look at them separately, all sin comes from this. All evil comes from, from this right here. And as, as John said, it's a reality in the world, and it's going to culminate in a big reality. Now, I'm going to talk about something today that, um, well, we don't talk a lot about in the church. And I'm probably not going to talk about, uh, as much about it as you would like me to. But we're going to touch on it because John touches on it. But we're also going to dive deep and see how that kind of impacts the church. Notice verse 18. Children, it is the last hour. And you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. So many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that, this, uh, that it is the last hour hour. And then it goes on to say, say this in verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not for us or of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be plain that they are all not uh, of us. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been with us, they would have continued with us. I, I, I love that right there. So here's one of the things that we have to understand. John lived with the continual expectancy that Jesus could return at any time. And he said two things that are very important about this kind of the end times. He says that we are in the last hour. 
Not only are we in the last hour, but in this last hour, the Antichrist will come. But what do we do with this? Because John talks about the last hour, but he told us that we were in the last hour 2,000 years ago. So for the last 2,000 years, we have been living in this time of expectancy that Jesus will return. Now, some have, su- have suggested that we are in the last minutes or even the last seconds of the last hour that John was talking about. I don't know that I want to make that definitive statement, but John says the Antichrist will come. And even outside the church, there is this kind of fascination with who is the Antichrist? What is the Antichrist? What is all of this about? So I just want to kind of tell you about the the term Antichrist. John is the only biblical author who uses this term. Now, there are other terms that were, were used, but John's the only one who uses Antichrist. And anti is a, a prefix that can mean opposite of or instead of. And a lot of times what we do with the, with the Antichrist is we talk that he is the opposite Christ, that Jesus does good, the Antichrist will be full of evil. But I, I think that might not be the best picture for us to have. I want to talk about instead of Christ. Uh, I'm not uh, an end times expert, never going to pretend to be one of those, uh, but one of the things that we have to understand is that the Antichrist most likely will be one that will look wonderful, he will look charming, he will look successful, he will be declared the winner and the the savior that everyone is looking for. And I do believe that there have been many global events throughout history. Uh, Right now, uh, coming off of COVID, I actually said during COVID that this is a perfect setup for an antichrist to come and and, and to, to declare he's got it all figured out. Now that Europe is unraveling with Ukraine and Russia. Again, we, we say the global stage could be set in such a way, but the global stage had been set this way previously. So I'm not going to make a definitive statement other than the Antichrist is expected to probably be a world dictator who leads humanity into what many will call a golden age. This is almost too good to be true. This is the Savior that we are all looking for And he will come and set up this global government, but yet his empire will come crashing down before the return of Jesus. But John is not so much as concerned about the Antichrist as he is with Antichrists. He says, listen, there's something happening within the church, and it was happening in the first century. It's been happening ever since where people rise up within the church, they seek leadership, leadership positions, they seek places of power and authority and teaching, and they seek to lead people away from Christ. And here's, here's, here's kind of the, the issue. It was happening then, it is happening now, and, and I'll say it like this, those walking the dominant path of this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, will always preach a counterfeit Jesus. And when I say that they will always preach a counterfeit Jesus, it's very important that we understand counterfeit. Now, if I'm going to counterfeit money, I'm not going to Hobby Lobby to get orange construction paper. Okay? Not going to do it. Uh, I'm not going to cut the the paper. In fact, you don't want me cutting the paper because I failed that in kindergarten Um, but I'm not going to cut the paper in triangles. I'm not going to put three, four, six, seven, eight, nine on the corners, right? And and just because he's the president right now, I'm just going to say, if it had been Trump a couple years ago, I'll just say, I wouldn't put Biden's picture on that. Everybody would be able to say, that's a fake. And I think that's the reality that we have to understand about a counterfeit. A counterfeit It it, it intends to look as much as real as possible, but yet it holds no inherent value. And so what we have to begin to understand a little bit 
about the, the ploy of false teaching. Notice verse 20. But you've been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because uh, no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar? This is, this is an underlying moment. Who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the Messiah. This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. That is false teaching. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son also has um, the Father also. And so here's something that I think is vitally important. We have to understand the spirit of false teaching as it is taking place as we, as we walk with Jesus. We have to understand, and I say, the spirit of false teaching. And, and I want to spend some time here and understand that the spirit of false teaching either takes Jesus completely out of the picture or it seeks to make Jesus less than Jesus. In fact, one of the, the, the popular false teachings today is what I'll call secular humanism. In fact, the, 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 the Apostle Paul says, listen, we know, regard no one the way we used to. It's either Jesus or nothing. So we're going to talk about the nothing here and how this comes into play and how this plays out in, in people's lives today. Many people within secular humanism believe that salvation lies within self. That if I can fulfill self, if I can gratify self, if I can... You know, how, many, how many times have people said, well, I'm a good person? Have you ever said that? So in other words, salvation lies within yourself. I, I'm a good person. And listen, I may not be Putin or anything, right? But I'm better than my neighbor because I keep my yard better. Or I love my wife more. And we think that we can, we can have this fulfillment and satisfaction and gratification because of self. And if we don't like self, we create a new one. We are living in a world today where we are radically changing and altering things. There was a person in my office many years ago who just decided they didn't like their name, so they just wanted a new one. Because there's this idea that if I don't like my identity, I just become somebody else. I and mean, We have things now, and I don't know what to think about this, but the metaverse, where we can just live these alternative lives independent of reality. And I'll, I'll just share with you, I don't know if you realize that this week there was a special day that they called D-Transformation Day. And it's many who had, had gone through uh, sex assignment reassignment, gender transformation, where they're coming out and saying, this is it? Because they felt like a new self would bring salvation and new self just brought new problems. So we have, you know, false teaching that falls into the, to the realm of self. And then we have false teaching that is really kind of a worldview that makes Jesus less than Jesus. I read several days ago, probably a couple weeks ago, that uh, it, this, this kind of struck me, that as soon as there was the gospel, there was the false gospel. As soon as people started telling people about Jesus, there were other people saying, no, 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 you got it all wrong. And so they said, this is who Jesus really, really is. And there's actually a book. The book is called the Pseudepigrapha. I'm not going to tell you to buy the Pseudepigrapha, because the Pseudepigrapha is a collection of what they call false gospels that were written a couple hundred years after Jesus. And there's the Gospel of Mary and the Gospel of Peter and the Gospel of Thomas, all these different gospels that people would assume fake names, a fake realities, and say, we're going to tell you who Jesus really is. And the reason why they didn't make it into the Bible is because they were false and they were written to, to destroy people. And you think, well, what's the big deal about that? I will tell you what the big deal is, and I don't want to bash on this, this type of stuff, 
How many of you may have seen, may have read, maybe have heard about the Da Vinci Code? Okay, the Da Vinci Code basically says, no, this is who Jesus really was. The Da Vinci Code is right out of the pseudepigrapha. Is that that's, that's kind of where we, 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 we begin to find how, how easy it is for false gospels to, to kind of come in. And basically the thing is, is, okay, we'll talk about Jesus, but Jesus is less than the Jesus that you're talking about. And that's a very, very dangerous thing. And then there is the Jesus plus gospel. Uh, my son, who lives up in Dodd City, Kansas, the youth pastor there, he, he really is into apologetics and different things. And he's really passionate about helping people see, kind of like, here's where the gospel is, and this is the false gospel. And one of the false gospels that we have in our world today, in the United States of America, this is big, it's growing throughout the world, but it's the prosperity message. It's, it's Jesus plus. And it's, it's Jesus, like, Jesus plus, and like, if you give more, and if you pray more, and if you do more, then God's going to send good things your way. And that sounds all and great, unless you're a, a Ukrainian Christian right now who's thinking, I just didn't give enough or pray enough. That gospel does not hold water. There's also the idea that if, if I know more, if I, you know, I, in fact, I, I use a term, and I don't know if I came up with the term, but it's the idea that you can be saved-er. There's a lot of people out there who think, and that's the Jesus plus. I'm doing, a, I'm doing a study right now through the life of Paul, who was one of the writers of the New Testament, one of the early evangelists, and I'm actually doing a study of uh, right now of his his writings in chronological order, not how they're in the Bible, but chronologically. And one of the first books that he wrote, one of the first letters that he wrote to the early churches was the book of Galatians, where there are people following Jesus, and then there were other people saying, no, 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 if you really want to be a Christian, you have to be Jewish first. You've got to add all this stuff. What Paul is saying, no, it, you can't be saved or you, you are saved by Jesus. So it's not something that is apart from Jesus, or you make Jesus less, or you add to Jesus. It is simply Jesus. And that's the, that's the message. That's the, that is the gospel uh, in a nutshell. And so when we talk about all the false teaching, we talk about all the, the deception that is going on, I, I think there's a couple of paths that we could take to address false teaching. One is we could become experts in all of the different religions. I actually took a class in college, Colts in the Occult, where you went, went around and studied all the different uh, world religions and how they were false and how Christianity was true. Good class. And, and, and I, I'm not going to say that that's a bad path, but I believe there is a better path. Let's look at verses 24 and 25. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He made to us eternal life. Sometimes it's good to read other versions of the Bible. I want to read verse 24 in, in, from the New Living Translation. So you must remain faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. If you do, you will remain faithful in the fellowship with the Son and with the Father. I love this right here. Notice, you must remain faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. Years ago, and in fact, there's a preaching class that I had to take, and I started taking preaching classes before the internet. And so we actually had to go to the library, and the assignment was we had to go to the library, we had to uh, read like Newsweek and Time and like newspaper and stuff like that, and photocopy stories uh, so that we could build our illustration library. That's basically what we had to do. So we had either our note cards or our notebooks, and we had all those cataloged. And then the internet happened, and then Google happened, and I don't have to do that uh, anymore. But I, I actually remember going to uh, the, the library at Dallas Christian College, 
And I, I read an article, I can't remember where I read the article, but it was profound to me and has stuck with me ever since, in that the FBI, the FBI actually has a division, and the division is all about counterfeit money. Like, these guys, all they do, deal with counterfeit stuff. That's their division. I'm thinking, how bad did you have to do on your FBI class to be in that division right there? So, anyway, th this is what they do. They are not experts in counterfeit money. Rather, they become so proficient in the nuances and the ID factors of real money, they're able to spot fake money because they know the real thing so much. And so 20-some years apart from that, it stuck with me. My job, my job is not to become an expert in all the other false teaching out there. I just have to be a passionate follower of Jesus. That's what it comes down to. And as a Christian, as Christians, we have the responsibility of having a firm grasp of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I love as it was originally taught. Why? Because that's when we're passionate about he was born of a virgin in Bethlehem. He lived a sinless life. He taught among us. He walked among us. He healed among us. He performed miracles among us. He was killed on a Friday. He was raised on a Sunday. He appeared to people. He ascended back into heaven, and he is coming again. Anything that preaches a different kind of gospel than that is a false gospel. John, as he wrote the biography of Jesus, recorded the words of Jesus like this, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That is the gospel. That is the gospel in its most simplistic form, and we must not ever deviate from that. And so as John kind of builds on the idea of focusing on the message of Jesus, we read on, and as we read on, I think, I think we're going to get a clue. A big clue. Notice verse 26. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. Now, remind you, John is teaching them right now, so there is a need for human teachers. But as his anointing teaches you, about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as uh, it has taught you, abide in him. I don't know where I heard this first, but this was profound when I heard it, and I'm going to go ahead and repeat it. Satan is not creative, but he's consistent in his deception. Listen, I, one person said it like this, Satan's a one-trick pony. All he wants to do is, is deceive and lie. And, and, and deceiving and lying, he is just absolutely consistent in that over and over and over again. Listen, deception is all around us. But as Satan deceives, there's something here that I, I think is it's a clue. I am not a smart person individual. I, I will tell you that, in fact, I'm just going to say this about Jim. Jim's not here. If Jim and I are in the room, I am never the smartest person in the room. I, I will tell you that. In fact, I'm seldom the smartest person in the room, but I figured out a thing or two, and one of the things that I figured out in reading the Bible is that when you read the Bible and you see words that are repeated often, those are clues. Those are like big clues. Those are like if your wife is talking to you and she says, you know what I want for my birthday sometime is, that's a clue. Figured that one out too. <laughs> but the reality is, in the book of 1 John, 
the word abide is mentioned 16 times. That's a clue. What is another clue is in chapter 2, the word abide is mentioned 10 times. And there could possibly be other inferences of the idea here. And so this is what I want to tell you. This is our bottom line. Satan, or excuse me, the best defense against spiritual deception is abiding in Christ. If you really want to know the secret of dealing with the spiritual deception that is going on in our world, remain in Jesus. Remain connected to Him. There are going to be philosophies out there that are going to say, no, it's not Jesus at all. There are going to be philosophies out there that are going to say, well, it's Jesus, but it's not the Jesus that you're talking about. There's philosophies out there that are going to say, well, it's Jesus, but you've got to add some stuff to Jesus. But we're reminded that what, what we need to do is, listen, Jesus, there's no other name under heaven given by men which we, by which we must be saved. It is Jesus. Jesus himself said, listen, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. We, we find salvation in the person of Jesus. And what, what John says is, echoing what Jesus said in John chapter 15, just abide in him. Just remain in Him. Be continually present with Him. Remain as one with Him. And, and, and actually, the, uh, the, the, the root here is not to be something different than Him. Abiding in Jesus means looking like Jesus. And so I thought about that this week, and I was like, how do I, how do I tell people to abide in Jesus? But then it hit me. I don't know that there's a how. Because the culmination of the Christian life ought to be, I just remain in Christ. I abide in Christ. It's not like that this is like just a feature of our walk with Jesus. It is our walk with Jesus. We remain in Him and He in us. And listen, what we do good in life is not because of anything that we have done, but because of our connection that is constant with Jesus. He's the life source. He says, I, listen, I'm the vine. You're the branches. What, what good comes from you is because you're connected to the nu nutritional life source of the vine. So remain in me, and I, and I will remain in you. And, and so, listen, I, I'll be honest with you. I struggle with this. I struggle with this because I'm a do person. Anybody like that? Like, I get up in the morning, and I'll just be honest with you. I get up in the morning with, I get to do stuff today. I'm that type of person. And so I've got a list of things that I want to get done. And if I'm not careful, I can do all the stuff that I need to do apart from Jesus. And so much of what I, sometimes, I'm honest with you, read my Bible, it's checking the box because it's what I'm supposed to do. Going to church, some of you have checked the box today. Praying, small group, whatever it may be, it's easy just to check the box. But what if we looked at everything that we did in our walk with Jesus was about, I get to remain in Him. And this is about, like, I read the Bible to abide and connect with Jesus. And, and I go to church to abide and connect with Jesus. What if we changed our thinking just, just a little bit here? In fact, I, I want to offer three words today. Not up here on the screen, but just three words. If you want to write them down, they're probably really good words. Uh, they're probably not originally with me either. Connect. To abide, to remain, to connect in Jesus. That's the goal. So many times, you know, listen, we say this, we say, you know, we don't want to connect people to Jesus and his way of life because that is the life. Connecting with Jesus is the goal. And I have to look at my own life and how many times, if I'm honest, I'm disconnected. 
I'm probably disconnected because there's so many other connections that are happening in my life. But the idea here is just to remain in Jesus, remain connected to Him. But I'm going to throw out another word. Trust. To walk with someone is to trust them. Those of you who have been in the military, those of you who are in law enforcement or the protective areas of you know, fire and you understand that when you walk with somebody, you've got to trust them. And when you walk with Jesus, the idea is that you trust Him. And in fact, you trust Him when it's hardest to trust Him. I know me. I, I love the idea of I, I can trust Jesus when I've exhausted all measures on my own. But to connect to Jesus, to remain in Jesus, to abide in Jesus is to trust Him even sometimes when it feels most awkward to do that. I add one more. Consistent. It's not a one-time shot. Our connection with Jesus remains consistent, continual in our lives. But there's proof that comes when we abide. Let me tell you about two proofs that we can get when we abide. Let's look at verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in, in, in shame at his coming. Anybody a little scared right now? I mean, those of us who grew up 70s and 80s, we remember like, They'll hit a button, we'll hit a button, and poof, it'll all be done. I probably fielded more questions about end times and how all this kind of plays in over the last three weeks than I have probably in the last three years. I think people are scared, but here's one of the things. When we abide with Jesus, this is, when we abide, we will walk with confidence until he returns. We don't have to be scared about what is on the horizon because we know who wins. And we know that ultimately he holds the future. Now verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Listen, righteous actions can happen in life, but they can come from one or two places. One, it can come from that idea, I'm doing righteous, I'm doing good so that God will be pleased with me. Or it can come from the fact that the more I walk with Jesus, the more connected I am to him, the more I will look like him. And so therefore, our righteous actions are proof that we are abiding in Christ. Will you join me in prayer? God and Father, thank you. Thank you for the grace of your Son. May we just abide in Him, remain in Him, and allow you to handle the fruit. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.